Today, we will learn how to have fresh cut flowers for ourselves and others from early summer to fall. It's always a delight to see flowers uh, blooming in the garden. So lots of times it's hard for us to cut them to bring them indoors. A designated cutting garden solves that problem. The purpose of a cutting garden is totally different than a regular flower garden. You don't have to worry about design. I mean, you don't have to worry about flow or scale or a certain style. The only things you do have to think about are how can I get the most bang for my bucks from these flowers? How can I get the most cuts in other words? And what flowers do I wanna plant so I can have them in my arrangements? We're gonna discuss um, th um, th in three basic steps here. One is uh, getting the area ready, which includes um, a site location and preparing the soil. And then we'll move on to planning the garden, the garden's layout and the types of flowers uh, and plants to consider putting in our garden. And then the maintenance and care of the garden. Remembering all the time that our goal is to get mas maximum production, in other words, the most cuttings. Um, the first thing you wanna do is walk around your property, make sure that wherever you're gonna place this garden that you have six to eight hours of full sun, no less than six. The other thing you're gonna need is uh, good drainage. Uh, these flowers don't like to have their uh, feet wet for long periods of time. In fact, a lot of them that we're going to talk about today are um, drought tolerant. Um, another thing is you're going to have to have an available water supply um, close by. You need the water, these plants, and I don't think any of us want to carry pails of water from one end of our property to the other. You're going to also need good quality soil. Um, you're going to need that because you're going to be doing a lot of snipping and clipping of your plants and they need to recover from all of uh, that activity. I like to tell people to remember you are feeding the soil so that uh, uh, it can supply to the plants all of the plants needs. The other thing is start small. Most of you aren't going to make this a job. Um, it was my job for a few years. And, uh, but you're just gonna do it for um, a hobby and to have um, nice flowers that you can bring inside for bouquets and give to families and friends. So keep it manageable. You don't need to have a sprawling area for uh, your flower garden. In fact, um, when I had my flower farm, I did have a quarter of an acre, but now I have very small a patio space and I have a couple of raised beds, uh, some regular containers and some grow bags, and I get flowers from early, uh, late spring to uh, fall right up to uh, the frost. Um, what sites um, do we, can we consider to put our um, uh, cutting garden in? Well, two of the best places would be your herb or your vegetable garden. And why do I say that? Well, your uh, cutting garden is a production garden and your herb and or vegetable gardens are also production gardens. So you've already done your homework. You've already um, have uh, mended your soil. You know you have enough sunlight. You have a water supply close by. So these are perfect places to put your cut garden. Um, you might also want to consider uh, putting one maybe at the side of a garage or maybe at the in the back of your property um, at the end of um, a um, flower garden that you already have. You really don't want to put a cutting garden in the front. It's not aesthetically uh, as pretty as a regular flower garden. I like to say it's more eclectic. So let's start getting the soil ready for our garden. And remember, we're always trying to provide continual support to the plants uh, so they will give us a um, number of cuttings. The best thing you can do for yourself is to get yourself a soil test. And you can do this by contacting your G UGA extension office. You can go down there. They have uh, these little bags cost $9. Um, it's not hard to do. We'll go through brief briefly. You take about eight to 10 scoops of soil from around your garden area and make sure to take your sample um, six inches uh, in depth, get a good slice 
of um, a sample so you get all the layers. And then you submit that sample to your Cherokee Extension Office. You can write on there that it's for a cutting garden. And they, uh, when you get the report back, it will suggest your fertilizer and needs and your pH needs for a cutting garden. You can refer to the UGA Circular 896 for um, detailed instructions on this, or you can simply call the office and they will glad give you some information. Uh, the first thing that uh, we're going to talk about is um, the pH. Um, pH, uh, it's good to have the correct pH because it helps your plants utilize the fertilizer and, and the nutrients uh, in your soil. A pH range is from zero being very acidic to 14 uh, very alkaline and seven being neutral. Georgia soil is slightly acidic at 4.5 to 5.5. So we wanna raise the pH so we would add lime. If we were to lower the pH, we would wanna add sulfur. But for our purposes here, we wanna raise the pH. So we are gonna add lime. And the best time to do this is in the fall when it has time to dissolve into um, the soil uh, uh, really well. If you didn't do that, all is not lost. You can uh, get some more finely ground lime that acts more quickly. Um, you might have to add uh, more of that though, and you might have to add it more often. The nutrients that your uh, flowers are going to use um, are the same as your vegetable gardens, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, nitrogen promotes uh, healthy leaves and phosphorus is important for a strong root system. Potassium is also important for the flower formation. And they're gonna suggest uh, supplements for you to use to correct these uh, deficiencies in your soil. Other things you wanna consider for your soil is a uh, good soil texture. And why do we need good soil texture? Well, it's important for the soil to have some air in it and to hold some moisture. So if you were to pick up some of your soil and put it in your hand and kind of bring your hand together and have a small softball and you were to throw that onto the ground, it should break apart. If it doesn't, um, your soil is probably too dense. And then um, we need to add some organic matter. Well, organic matter, what is it? Well, it can be your uh, compost, it can be a layer of leaf mold, it can be grass clippings. And this is gonna help improve um, the water retention of your soil and the drainage of your soil. Um, you can buy uh, compost if you have a small area, you can buy it at uh, the nurseries at, uh, in a bag, or you can uh, get it bulk if you have a bigger area, or you can make your own compost pile. And you can get information on how to do this at uh, UGA also, and give the office a call and they will uh, steer you in the right direction and give you the information for that. You also wanna avoid compaction of your soil. Um, I always like to work the soil as early as I can in the season but I don't like to um, work it when it is uh, wet. That's just gonna cause uh, compaction of your soil down the road even more. So uh, try to work it early and when it's not wet. We also wanna create walkways uh, between our rows um, so that we are not walking through our flowers and compacting the soil around their roots. Now let's go on to planning the garden, the layout out of our garden. Uh, most of uh, cutting farms, um, uh, and mine included, had wide rows. It's the most common way to do it. It reduces the reaching distance for uh, pulling weeds and for uh, picking the flowers. We also have to give ourselves pathways between the throw, uh, rows to uh, get our equipment through and uh, to uh, easily move around to um, do some of the tasks that we need to do to the plants, watering, uh, some other things we'll talk about a little bit later, and to carry our pails of water, because after we pick, we have to put the um, flowers directly into the pails of water. You also might wanna think about the needs of your plants. 
Um, for instance, um, if you have to, if you want to put sunflowers in your uh, cutting garden, you would put them at the back of the garden or at the end of the row. Uh, you don't want to put them in the front where it would um, block um, the sunlight from getting to some of your other flowers behind them. You also want to consider some of your plant needs. Uh, you might have uh, some plants, like I said before, that are drought tolerant and some maybe that are not as drought tolerant. So you want to put the drought tolerant uh, flowers together. You, almost, uh, you might want to consider uh, putting your annuals uh, separate from your perennials also. You want to try to choose flowers with different blooming times. Um, so you make sure to have uh, various flowers through the season. Uh, this isn't always the easiest thing to do when you get started, but with a little practice, it gets easier. And um, you can go online and Google bloom charts. Uh, you can Google anything nowadays and bloom charts will come up and it'll give you a lot of information on the flowers uh, times. Now this is where the fun begins. We're gonna start choosing what flowers we wanna put in our garden. Um, and some of the things to consider when choosing our flowers are we want flowers that have long stems. It's so much easier to work with long stems when you're making a bouquet than short stems. You can't add to the stem, but you can cut off the stem. You want flowers that have a long flowering duration and repeat bloomers, uh, which are called cut and come again. We'll talk about those again in a few minutes also. You want to consider bulbs. Um, what bulbs? Some bulbs, uh, they bloom early in the season and then they fade away and they're gone. And there's other uh, so, uh, bulbs that you can put, um, usually the favorite of a cut uh, flower farm uh, would be uh, dahlias or gladiolias. Uh, their summer, you get a little um, longer um, time out of them. And then we wanted to see if we want annuals or perennials. The other thing you want to consider um, um, knowing is the hardiness zone of, of where you live. And why is this important? Well, if you were to go into one of your nurseries and see that um, the hardiness zone was eight, for instance, it would not uh, work well here in northern Georgia since our zone is a 7B. The U.S. Department of Agriculture breaks up regions into, zone, uh, into zones, and the zones are based on the average winter uh, low temperature. Um, ours, like I said, is a 7B, and the average um, minimum average temperature in the winter is 5 to 10 degrees. So we, when we choose a plant, we want the zone to be the same or less, equal to or less, than our hardiness zone. We want to also talk about sources where we can get these uh, flowers and we can get them at the local nurseries, seed catalogs. Um, I love to get my seed catalogs at, after the first of the year. It's like Christmas all over again. Uh, maybe some of you remember when you were kids, uh, when you got your Sears catalogs and Penny catalogs and you would just go through it and say, I want one of these, I want one of these. That's how I am with my seed catalogs. You can have the seed catalogs sent to you in the mail or you can um, get them online. Um, two of the seed um, catalogs that I like are um, Johnny Select Seed and Burpee. Um, they give a lot of information online and in their um, seed catalogs about uh, growing uh, cutting gardens. Um, and you can also get plants uh, through our Master Gardener plant sale. So go visit it tomorrow and see what you can find. I like to start my seed from uh, my flowers from seed, excuse me, my flowers from seed. <clears throat> By no means you have to do it, but give it a try. Um, just pick uh, flowers um, that are easy to start from seed. And I'm going to tell you two real easy ones now, and it would be your Cosmos and your Zinnias. Um, you, when you get your seed packet, there is a lot of information on the back of that packet. So make sure you read it. Uh, it's going to give you a description of your plant. 
and it's going to give you instructions uh, how to grow your plant. It's going to tell you uh, when to sow it outdoors, if you want to sow outdoors, and it's going to sow, uh, tell you when to start it inside um, if you choose to start your plants inside. It will tell you the planting depth. And um, I just want to tell you uh, one little thing here. If somebody should give you some seed that they collected the year before and they don't have, you don't have a seed uh, packet, uh, a little thing to know about your seeds is you would plant it about double the uh, width of that seed. So some of these seeds are itty bitty when you get them and uh, you would just basically scatter them onto the surface of your um, soil. Some more instructions that are important on these seed cat on these seed packets are, uh, and we're going to talk about one of these later, is pinching when to pinch back your uh, seedlings, and that's very helpful if you uh, try to grow uh, snapdragons. Um, here is some of the equipment that um, I do when I start my seed. Uh, one thing you need to have is you need to have a grow light. There are a lot of grow lights out there now on the market. Um, they're not uh, real expensive. There's even some now that you can clip onto a table. Um, and I have like a, a tray table that I can clip it onto and it will hold a, a tray of seeds. And then uh, this one you can see in the picture uh, goes on my kitchen counter, it doesn't take up a lot of space and you can put um, a tray underneath that or smaller trays. I also like seed starting kits. Um, you can see that on the left, um, that big square thing there. And uh, I happen to like burpees. Um, it's self-watering. It, it, it's, it's pretty easy to use. And I think you would like that one. I also collect containers during the year. Like uh, the one there next to the burpee is um, just probably I got salad in it. And I just put my seed starting soil in there and um, plant my seed, close it up, and then I have made my mini greenhouse. And once those seeds start to sprout, I would open it up and uh, continue to grow them. Um, also, if you look in the middle, you can see uh, I have a container and it looks like it's in a, a plastic bag. Well, it is, it's a plastic bag from a grocery store. I put the container in the plastic bag and um, wrap it around the container. And again, I have my little mini greenhouse and uh, when they seeds begin to sprout, I would take it out of the bag. I also like to fool around with some of the um, hydroponic uh, machines they have out there now. These are by Aero Garden. They're pretty simple to use. Um, it, it, it speeds up your germination and growing on uh, by about 50%. Uh, so you might want to try this. Um, they're fun to use. Uh, you can even use them all winter long, not even put them outside. I put the plants outside and you could have uh, greens for your salad all winter long. Uh, it might be something you might want to put on your uh, wish list for Christmas or your birthday. Um, over to the right hand side, you can see uh, that these are all the plants that I have uh, started inside and I have uh, started to take them out now to harden them off. Um, if you look carefully, you can probably see there's some tomato plants there. There's a bunch of zinnias. I think there's some cosmos. Um, there's uh, peppers. There's a, um, a bunch of things there that I have started. Planting from seed gives you a little more variety. So that's why you might wanna try it. Let's talk about the different types of flowers now. Um, the annual flower is what we're going to talk about first. And what is uh, the definition of an annual flower? Well, it's uh, a flower that has its whole life cycle from seed to flower and back to seed again in one single year. What are some of the advantages of um, planting the annual flowers? Well, they have the longest flowering season. And there is a wide selection of plants to pick from. It's inexpensive to buy seed. You can get a seed packet now for $3.95 and they probably have 50 seeds in them. And I have even gone to the dollar store and picked up some seeds and uh, germination was pretty good on them uh, for just a dollar. 
You can also uh, get plugs. Plugs are available. Uh, lots of times, um, if you go to your um, nurseries, you can say, do you have any plugs I can buy? And uh, they do. Now, what is a plug? Let's go back to the previous um, slide. And let's look at our uh, burpee starting kit. Each one of those little squares is a cell. And that's what you're going to uh, plant your seed in. Once that seed has developed enough to have a uh, good root system, you can just pop it out of that cell and you can plug it in to uh, the ground or another container, hence the name plug. Um, another thing that you can do with your annual flowers is succession planting. Uh, what is succession planting? Uh, let's say uh, you have uh, sunflowers that you wanna plant and they are single stem sunflowers. Well, once you cut that sunflower, you're not gonna get another um, flower off of that plant. So if you plant these seed uh, every three weeks for several weeks, you will extend the length of time that you will be able to cut your sunflowers. You can also uh, do this with zinnias and cosmos. Some of the um, disadvantages of your uh, annual flowers are they need to be planted every year. And you have to do your soil preparation every year. And they do need some maintenance um, through the year. And you might have to uh, fertilize them uh, through the season if they start to um, not bloom as much. And especially if you do them in containers because um, every time you water your plant in a container, um, your uh, fertilizer is uh, and nutrients are going to uh, leach out of that pot. So you're probably going to have to fertilize through the season. Annuals are also shallow rooted, which means their roots are close to the surface and they dry out fast. That's why it's important to have that water source uh, close by your garden. Um, I'm going to talk about some of my favorite um, plants now uh, for uh, the cutting garden, and that being because they are easy to grow, they have a good vase life, and they have uh, long stems. The first one I'm going to talk about is the zinnia. If I had only one flower to pick to put in my cut flower garden, it would be zinnias. And why do I say that? Well, first of all, there are several dozen or more varieties of zinnias on the market. Uh, they bloom from summer to fall. Uh, they bloom early summer, to, uh, early summer if you get a head start, a jump start on them and start them inside. Um, they can be direct seeded, like I said, outside or started inside. They tolerate drought conditions and they have nice long stems. Um, they also are what I mentioned before, a cut and come again. And I, in fact, I think there once was a, um, a variety that was called cut and come again. And what that means is the more you pick, the more they bloom. Um, just pick, 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 and you will get um, so many bouquets from a zinnia that you'll be able to give them to friends and families. Uh, some of my favorite uh, varieties of zinnias are Benary's Giant. It has an, a four to six inch stem on it, and it has low susceptibility to powdery mildew. That's that little uh, white powdery thing you see on the leaves, uh, especially towards the end of the season for the zinnia. Um, I didn't never care too much if I got that because I stripped the uh, leaves off of the stems uh, for my bouquets anyway. Another one that's interesting is the giant cactus mix. Um, there's a nice orange color one in there and the petals are spiky. Peppermint sticks is another uh, one you might wanna try. It has swirls of um, red and yellow and white, it, it's very interesting. And new for me this year was a series called Zinderella. And what that looks like, it looks like a, um, a cone flower, the newer cone flowers that have like the pom-pom center and then a single um, petal all the way around. 
And they had some brilliant colors in those that I planted this year. There was an orange, a uh, bright, bright red. Uh, I think there's a purple and um, a peach. Another one of my favorite annual flowers is the snapdragon. <clears throat> I was very happy when I came down south to learn that I could plant some snaps in the, in the fall. They would uh, make it through the winter. And then on, in late spring, I could have these beautiful bouquets um, just out of just snapdragons. Um, they are very stately looking. They're tall. They add some um, brilliant colors to your bouquets. And I, when I grew them, I grew the Rocket Series. Um, they're very popular among cut flower growers and they're good for spring blooming. And then there is a Costa Series that is very good for fall blooming. Some more of my other favorite annuals um, are a Celosa. Um, this for, uh, these varieties love the heat they're easy to start inside and they're easy to dry direct, uh, to direct seed. And another benefit from them is that they dry well. Um, so you can dry these flowers um, after you enjoyed them a little while in your vase. And um, you will have a bouquets that you can make out of the dried flowers um, during the uh, dreary uh, months of winter. There are three varieties um, to Celosa. Uh, the first being plume. Uh, then coxcomb, and then wheat. Uh, the plume is a very feathery looking um, a bloom. Uh, examples that the cut flower farmers use are pompous plume. Um, this is gaining uh, some more popularity in the nurseries in recent years, but um, the ones that you see in the nurseries are um, smaller. Um, they don't get much more than, I don't think, uh, maybe 18 or 24 inches. Uh, I don't even think they get 24 inches. And uh, the pompous plume um, gets uh, much bigger than that. And you can have one giant uh, bloom on this plant, or you can pinch it back. That's something we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And you will be able to get multiple small stems um, from this uh, plant, and you can use it as fillers in your bouquet. Um, there's also um, coxcomb. Um, you can see that um, up on the upper uh, right hand side in the middle there of the screen. Um, to me, it kind of looks like coral or a brain, but originally I guess they thought it looked like the comb of a rooster. Uh, so it got its name coxcomb. Um, the easiest one to grow is the chief series. There's many colors to pick from, from yellow to orange. Um, to red, to magenta, uh, just a good uh, plant to um, a variety to plant. Then there is, if you can see down uh, lower on the right, uh, there is a Kramer series that is called the fan type, and it looks uh, more like a fan. And uh, this one you see here, I had collected seed uh, the prior year and uh, then replanted it. And uh, it just couldn't make up its mind, I guess, if it wanted to be magenta or yellow. The last one we're going to talk about is the wheat type. And um, you can see that on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, they uh, are um, usually bicolored. Uh, there's a flamingo feather and a pink flamingo. Um, they dry very nice. Uh, and it's more, the top of the bloom is a more uh, vibrant color. And then as you go down, it washes out into a, a white or um, paler pink. Um, there also are available in solid colors. It's in the Selway series. And I believe that is uh, colors right now. And that Selway series are terracotta and white. Um, some more of my favorites are straw flowers. Um, they're brilliant colors. You see them on the screen, uh, pinks and yellows and peach. Um, they're just uh, very happy colors and they are easy to start inside or grow outside too. And they're another one that can be dried uh, for um, bouquets that you can make so you can enjoy them during the winter. Um, I used to grow the mammoth series. I like that one the best. 
Um, Gomfrina is another um, choice for your annuals. Um, that's gaining more and more popularity in your nurseries now, uh, but it's a shorter version of the uh, Gomfrina that we use in um, our gardens when we have um, flower farms. It's easy to grow from seed. Uh, the one that I really loved and my customers loved was Strawberry Field. And you can see that on the right, on the bottom, um, that it is bright red and it dries. When it's dry, um, it stays that bright red color. Um, other colors available are uh, white, pink, and purple. And then I don't think anybody probably can have a garden uh, either without Cosmos. Uh, Cosmos, uh, they bloom from spring to summer and fall. Um, it seems like when I had uh, sold flowers that the men always uh, liked the, the Cosmos, I think maybe because they were kind of dainty and feminine looking. And so they always chose those to put in bouquets for their wives. Uh, there is a double click series out there, double blooms, long stems, several colors. And um, some of you uh, might want to uh, put these uh, in your pots on your patio or plant them near your patio because it is said that they help repel mosquitoes. Uh, another popular mix uh, is the Versailles mix and they were developed for cut flower production. They have strong stems and it withstands um, uh, considerable handling. The last one I'm gonna talk about uh, for annuals today are sunflowers. I don't know anybody uh, that doesn't love these great big oversized daisies. Um, they just make people happy. Uh, they are easy to start inside. Yes, you can start them inside as long as you plant them out after they get about their second or third true leaves into the, you plant them into the ground. But they are very easy to direct seed. And like we said before, they are a good candidate for succession planting. They come in many colors now. They come in reds and whites and yellows, oranges, and they even have green. They come in different heights. They come up, they can be 50 inches and they can be uh, 36 inches. There are also pollinus varieties. Um, pollinus varieties came around, um, I think in the eighties and um, they used though, so they would, uh, the florist and cut flower farmers would have another alternative for brides. Uh, before that, um, they didn't like to use them because once you get that pollen on your wedding dress, you're never gonna get it out again. They come in a single stemmed or they come in branching. And like I said, they are good for succession planting. Um, some of my favorite varieties were Moulin Rouge, um, I had a florist that called me continuously for this uh, flower. It is uh, the, the chocolate. That's all I can think of when you look at it. It's so chocolate covered uh, looking. Um, and Sonia. Sonia is, um, both of these are branching types. Uh, Sonia is um, orange, uh, uh, almost an apricot color. And the reason I like the Sonia is because it started branching farther down on the plant and it would have strong stems that went straight up on the plant. Um, some of the other branching ones branch farther on the plant and they uh, kind of uh, get um, entangled with each other. But these were farther down and went straight up and they had very strong stems. Uh, another um, good uh, uh, one to grow is teddy bear. Uh, that is a good uh, candidate for a container, uh, 36 inches. Uh, kids seem to love this one for, it's uh, just very happy looking. And then the Pro, uh, Pro Cut series, um, they're pollenless and single stemmed. Uh, one thing I wanna tell you about the pollenless varieties is that um, they, my customers used to tell me that they um, used to uh, last up to two and a half weeks in the vase if they were pollenless. Uh, there are semi-pollenless ones too. Uh, you can grow all of these in raised beds, uh, containers or grow bags. If you decide that you wanna uh, grow one of the taller ones in a container, you might wanna put a layer of rock on the bottom 
of that container uh, before you put in the soil so that it doesn't topple over in case you have some uh, wind. Let's move on now to uh, perennial flowers. What's the definition of a perennial? Well, a perennial will die back to the ground at the end of the year, uh, a season, and it will regrow from the same root system the following year. Some of the advantages are easy care, uh, they're dependable, uh, there's many varieties of colors and textures, and their longev longevity. Um, there are perennials like your um, uh, peonies and your hostas that they will last uh, five years and you don't have to do too much to them during that five years at all. They're just um, a nice plant. Some of the disadvantages of your perennials would be the initial expense. Uh, you all know when you go to the nursery and you look at those uh, plants that are in the five, uh, five gallon, two gallon, they cost a lot more than um, your uh, flowers that are in a six pack or a four pack and uh, considerably more than a packet of seed. Um, the first return, the, uh, you get a poor return the first year. Uh, I mean, uh, the yield on a lot of these, you don't get a good yield. You have to wait a year or two before you get a lot of blooms uh, from these plants. Um, you probably want to section them off by themselves, um, like I said before, uh, and um, the size of the plant. These plants can uh, keep growing, uh, and you would have to um, split them over time. Some of my favorite perennials are yarrow. Um, you can see that at the top on the right. There's many colors to choose from. They also can be dried. And there also is a, I think it's called Colorado series. Uh, and they have a lot of sunset colors in them like brighter reds and brighter oranges. Um, they're very nice too. Peonies, I love peonies. Um, they smell delightful. There's a range of color, uh, many ranges of color. And uh, yes, uh, they can have a long vase life. I like to pick my peonies when if I took the bud in my hand and um, smooshed it a little bit, it would feel like a marshmallow. And then I also like to uh, pick them in the hard bud stage. They will continue to open up as they are in uh, the water in your vase. Shasta daisies is another one that's very easy to grow, and it's a great filler uh, for your bouquets also. Lamb's ear is interesting. It's a fast grower, um, and especially by the second year, you have a, a fairly good sized plant, and it also is a good filler for your bouquets. Black Eyed Susan is probably maybe uh, the backbone or the favorite of a perennial for your garden. Um, it is a uh, rutabecchia, as some of you might know, and it is yellow uh, and it makes a nice bouquet even all by itself with nothing uh, put with it. Uh, I love liatris. Um, it's very stately looking. It gives some uh, vertical sense to my bouquets. It comes in purple and white, and I believe it also comes in a pink that's not listed here, but I think it does. Butterflies love it. It grows in poor soil, is drought tolerant. And the first year you get uh, quite a few uh, blooms from it. It is just as uh, a plant that doesn't uh, want to quit on you. A stilby is um, another flower that's nice. Uh, many colors uh, ranging from whites to uh, even a lilac color. And um, the leaves are interesting on this plant too, and they can be used as a uh, filler in your um, bouquets also. I also like red hot poker. Don't ask me why, I just get drawn to this plant. It uh, comes in uh, orange, uh, yellow, and I believe red. And they do have a miniature uh, form of this plant now, and it does very well in containers. Uh, let's move on now to uh, bulbs. Uh, the definition of a bulb is a plant that stores its complete life cycle in an underground structure. And that includes your bulbs, your corms, and your tubers. 
Gladiolias would be an example of a corm. A corm is round, uh, flat looking with like little scales around it. A calla lily and dahlias are tubers. They look like little fingers hanging down. And then of course we all know uh, what the daffodil uh, bulb looks like. Gladiolias are, uh, you either love them or you hate them. Uh, that's what I found out. I had either had customers that, yep, I want all I can get or, oh, nope, I don't want them. Um, they come in various colors. Um, they also have miniature ones now that can be grown in containers. So you might wanna give that a try. Calla lilies, um, I love calla lilies. They come in whites and pinks and a purpley color, even black. And their uh, flowers and leaves can be used in arrangements. Um, some of the varieties of calla lilies, their leaves are green and they have like white spots on them, um, almost like polka dots. And they uh, last a long time uh, in your arrangements also. They can be grown in containers because they don't need to be planted deeply so like some of your other uh, tubers might. And they are a mid to late season plant. Dahlias, um, uh, you can't go wrong with dahlias. There are so many colors, so many textures of uh, dahlias, so many different heights. Some can be up to 50 inches, and then there are border um, dahlias that can be anywhere from 24 to 36 inches. And uh, border uh, dahlias are good to put in your containers. Uh, Daffodils, a lot of people like to put in daffodils. Um, I never use them on uh, in my flower farm, but there are many varieties and they do bloom early and then they're gone. Some plants you might wanna think to put in your uh, bouquets and these might not be in your garden. You might, or they, they might be, and they might not be. They might be in another part of uh, one of your other flower gardens. Uh, think out of the box a little bit when you uh, think about these plants. Um, the first one is the coleus. There are uh, so many different uh, colors uh, of coleus now on the market and they're easy to grow and they're easy to root. Um, down here you can take a snippet of um, coleus from one of your established plants. You don't even have to root it, you can just stick it in a pot and uh, you will have another new plant in no time. Um, coleus are, many of them now are sun coleuses. They love to be in the sun, so you don't have to worry that they are, are only a shade plant. Carrots, well, you got carrots in your um, garden uh, for your vegetable garden. Um, instead of harvesting all of them, why don't you let some of them go to seed? And um, they make a very interesting statement in your bouquets too. Uh, they, they look just like Queen Anne's lace and uh, they're easier to grow in my opinion. Um, I've even taken some when I've thinned out my carrots and believe it or not, I just dig a hole, put it in, nurture it a little bit and it uh, grows on and I have it in my uh, cutting garden. Hostas are another thing to consider. Um, there's uh, many colors and textures to the leaves and many varieties. There are uh, leaves that go from white to some that even have a blue tinge. Um, Dusty Mil Miller is another a good plant to put in as a filler, but I think my all time favorite is basil. Uh, when I had uh, my flower farm business, I sold what I called um, herbal, herbal bouquets. And these bouquets are made up of zinnias and basil. And they, customers love them. Um, why do I like basil? Well, uh, it smells amazing. It's fast growing. Uh, it's drought tolerant. And you can use uh, just the leaves from this plant or you can let it go into the flowering stage and use the flowering stems. Um, varieties that I used to like to put in my herbal bouquets were uh, lime, uh, smells delicious, a uh, lemon, and a cinnamon. And then they're also for um, different color besides just the green leaves, I like to use what was called red Reuben. 
Um, we're going to talk now about some maintenance and care of our plants uh, when they're growing on. And um, there's uh, pinching, deadheading, uh, staking, and then weeding and watering. Uh, we all know we have to weed. Um, we don't want the weeds to overtake our flowers and we must water. Um, staking, uh, you probably all know uh, uh, know about staking. Uh, that would be before you put in your uh, dahlia bulb, for instance, um, you would put a stake uh, right in back of where you're gonna put your uh, dahlia bulb. And then as the dahlia uh, comes out of the ground and gets bigger, you would tie it to the stake, uh, bamboo stake for most of your purposes and you can get them anywhere. And you just wanna remember not to um, tie it too tight to the stake because we don't want to injure the stem. Uh, if we do injure the stem, it won't be able to with, um, bring up the water and the nutrients um, to the uh, flower. The first one that you might not know too much about is pinching. Uh, what is pinching? Well, pinching is uh, basically, um, it's just removing the top or center portion of the plant so we get a denser uh, plant, we're going to get more side shoots um, and it's just going to increase, um, it's going to increase the production of our plants. Um, good candidates for this are um, foliage plants that are soft stemmed, um, like the basil that I was just talking about and your uh, coleus plants. They benefit greatly from pinching. Um, some of your uh, cut garden flowers that benefit from it are, we said this in the beginning, uh, you sometimes find this information on the back of your seed packet, um, is snapdragons. And then you can also do this to your um, zinnias and your celosa. Um, and like I said, lots of times you'll find on the back of your seed packet, uh, it'll tell you uh, when it's three inches high, uh, you might want to pinch back, uh, like for snapdragons. And then I think celosia, lots of times it will say uh, six inches or more to pinch back. Um, if you don't have a seed packet or you, uh, or you threw your seed packet away before you didn't keep it, uh, you can also Google all uh, this online uh, and it will uh, give you information on pinching. Um, how, what do we use to do the pinching? Well, um, we, you can use your thumb and your index finger. Uh, that's basically where it's got its name from. Or you can use uh, snips or garden scissors. Um, when I uh, had my business, I had a lot of them to uh, pinch back, so I would use snips. The only thing you have to remember about if you use uh, snips or garden shears is that uh, between the trays or the varieties, you wanna um, sterilize your equipment. Uh, you might have a disease you don't even know that's going on yet and you don't wanna spread it from uh, one uh, group of plants to another group. Um, another time when you um, do this, you can do this at the seedling stage and uh, you can do this as the plant is growing on. Uh, we're going to talk about it right now in the seedling stage um, uh, of your plants. And um, if you chose to, to do this, uh, plant your seeds, um, your plants from seed, um, you are going to do this when you see the first set of or second set of true leaves. Um, what the plant, when you first, um, the seed first germinates, um, you're gonna, the first um, little thing that comes out of that seed is what they call a cotyledon. Uh, cotyledons are referred to as not true leaves uh, and the leaf, and then the, uh, as it grows on, it gets its uh, true leaves. And it's pretty easy to do this process. You would just uh, look at your plant and look at your, uh, where your cotyledons are. Um, you, you'll know what these are. They're, they're the, like I said, they're the first um, to, uh, set of um, things to emerge from your uh, seed. And they look completely different than your regular leaves. So you look at your cotton leaves and you follow them straight up until you see your first 
or second set of true leaves. Then you go up right above that uh, where the leaf junction is and you just snip that off. And what that is going to do is after about a week, you're going to set, see a set of two new branches emerging from where you made that cut. And that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to, um, to get more, um, uh, more stems on that plant to create, uh, to get more production from that plant and a denser plant. It's very helpful to do this when you're planting um, these out in the field because you want your uh, plant to be denser on the bottom uh, to form stems closer to the bottom instead of farther up on your plant uh, because um, it can, uh, if it is farther up on your plant, you can um, get uh, wind damage and your plant can just crack off. Another thing that we do to our, uh, oh, I wanna say um, examples of this, of course, you can do is your snapdragons, uh, which we talked about, celosia and straw flowers. A uh, deadheading, um, that's another thing, and that's removing your old or spent flowers during the plant's growing season. And that too should increase your production by uh, making the plant um, have new, create new blooms. Um, it encourages your plant to send energy um, into making new blooms instead of the plant um, going to seed. I like to tell people that um, it's like telling the plant, okay, don't go to sleep, wake up, start making a whole new set of blooms for me that I can pick. And uh, like I said, this will also increase your production. Uh, now let's talk about when to harvest and our, our plants. We want to harvest our plants early in the morning or as late as possible. Uh, you might have to go to work early in the morning. And so um, you can't um, uh, get it up and start picking early in the morning. So you can do it as late as possible um, when you come home. Just don't do it during the heat of the day. Uh, the flowers lose their moisture during the heat of the day, uh, during the heat of the day, and um, they won't last as long in your vase. Know uh, when the flowers you have selected are ready for cutting. Um, there's many different um, uh, ways to know this. Um, plants are all different. Um, one that I don't have here, but I, I'll explain is uh, like your glads. Uh, glads bloom from the bottom up. So um, you want to pick that glad or gladiolia um, when it has three or four blooms on the bottom. And then as uh, it's in the vase, it will continue to open up and you would take the spent blooms off the bottom of the stems, recut them and put them back in the water. And that makes for a long vase life. There's also, um, I wanna talk about zinnias when it's ready to harvest zinnias. What we use, of that test is called the wiggle test. And what that is, is you grab the stem seven or eight inches away from your flower head and you just gently shake it. If the stem uh, bends, it's not ready. And believe me, there is nothing worse than picking a whole bunch of beautiful, beautiful zinnias going to put them in the vase and you get one and it bends and believe me they bend right next to that head and then that flower is unusable you just have to throw it away. Celosia is another one uh, when the uh, stem is sturdy um, that is ready to pick but you want to try to pick this plant uh, before this flower before it goes to seed it likes to go to seed and get these little black seeds um, in the base of the um, flower or bloom. And um, they're messy. Uh, they get in your water, they get all over your table. Uh, and um, if you don't care if they get over your table, then it's not necessary. But I mean, if you're giving it to somebody uh, for a gift, um, it's better to get them before they go to seed. How else do we have to be uh, take care of our plants when we're harvesting? Well, we need a bucket of clean water. 
Uh, we need sharp tools, no dull tools. Um, if you have a dull tool and you collapse that stem uh, when you're cutting it, um, it's not going to draw up the water and it's not going to um, be very long before it uh, is not good looking. It's gone completely uh, dead in your water. You want to cut at an angle. Um, cutting at a 45 degree, degree angle gives you more of a surface area so that uh, the, the stem can draw up water. No leaves in the water. Um, that just adds to um, getting um, dirty water quicker. We want to strip the leaves um, from the flowers and it's very simple to do. You just hold the stem and run your finger straight down the stem and those leaves will come right off. Um, the exception to that uh, is uh, sunflowers, for sure. You won't be able to do it to a sunflower. And gomfrina, sometimes they have um, three little um, leaves right under the um, head of that flower. And I like to lots of times um, cut those off a little bit, but um, you don't have to. It's whatever you like to do. Um, well, that's the information that I have for you today on your uh, cut gardens. Um, I hope you all kind of give it a try. Um, we've gone through a bad year this year and flowers, um, I don't know about you, but flowers always make me happy and feel good. And when I can give some to my friends that I haven't seen for a while, it's such a nice uh, gift to give them. Uh, we have some references here that you can refer to. Um, uh, on this page. So uh, look these up for some more information. I wanna thank you all today for tuning in and supporting our programming. We are very, very grateful uh, for you tuning in. And uh, we wanna take a moment now, uh, if you could give us some feedback, uh, that's how we get better at serving you. Well, Linda, now it's time to have some fun job. and enjoy uh, and ask some questions. I'm impressed. Uh, I learned a lot. We had one question here uh, come into the chat on supporting dahlias uh, when they begin to topple. How do you go about keeping dahlias upright? Staking them. You need to stake your dahlias. Um, so they don't topple over, especially if you have the higher, um, the ones that are 50 inches, 40 inches, uh, even 36 inches, you need to stake them. Mm -hmm. What about that? And that's uh, just like, uh, for most, huh? Oh, I was just gonna ask about that, uh, like flower netting that you can put out over say a bed and allow the flowers to grow up through it. Oh, you can put that's flower it. netting over, you can put flower netting over a bed but um you know for most of the people that are probably listening here for their um cut gardens uh just a simple bamboo stake uh, would be the simplest way to do it but there is uh netting that you can put over but that would be if you were growing i think uh, a ton of them like if you had a flower farm i would suggest it then but otherwise i would just say a stake okay you just want to plant your bulb uh, before you plant your bulb put the stake in the ground and then plant your bulb. And then as the bulb comes up, you will, um, don't try to put the stake in afterwards so it might hurt the root system. So put that in before you plant your tuber. And then as the tuber comes up, you can tie it uh, to the stake. All right. Well, uh, other than question on uh, the recording, yes, we're gonna record it. We'll shoot you all a link uh, once we get it up on the uh, I have something else I forgot to tell them. Okay. I, um, I, I forgot to tell them something. Um, I meant to tell them uh, two things, actually. Um, two, uh, one was that um, in a, a three uh, foot by six foot bed, uh, you can get 20 plants. I don't think I mentioned that. And that is uh, plenty for um, bouquets all through your season. And another little trick for your... Um, sunflowers um, is um, some of the some of them have big heads and if you want the head to be smaller 
uh, for bouquet purposes, um, then you can plant your sunflowers six inches by six inches in an area, and that will uh, create a smaller flower head for your bouquets. Okay. All right. And, uh, Chris has a question here about home test kits for NPK. Um, I'm assuming that's kind of the over-the-counter uh, solution type tests or something like that. I would not trust those uh, in my garden. Um, you know, a soil sample uh, brought to us goes to the lab to be analyzed on million dollar equipment. Uh, these little over-the-counter uh, solution-based uh, test kits, uh, you could end up under fertilizing or over fertilizing with, with a test kit like that. So um, that's my general thoughts on those. Um, Patricia has a question on when do we separate bulbs? When, when do we separate what? Bulbs. So our bulbs. Oh, when do we separate our bulbs? Mm -hmm. um, mm, what kind of bulbs? Oh, let's just go with the common ones, daffodils. Um, Tulips, maybe if we can get tulips to last more than one okay. year. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, tulips, if you can get them to last more than one year. Um, well, we don't want to separate any of our bulbs until they have completely died back. Um, they get their um, all their nourishment, the bulb does, from that greenery on the top. So um, we want to make sure they die back. Um, I never usually uh, separate bulbs uh, for a few years, uh, my daffodils or anything. They, they'll start to get uh, big and they won't be producing as much, as many flowers, and then you'll, you'll know. And then that's when you'll probably have to start digging some up and, and separating them. Okay. And then after we dig them up here in another couple of weeks, once the foliage dies back, how do we keep those bulbs until planting time in the fall? Uh, you want to keep them in a dry place. Um, uh, lots of times I keep mine in uh, vermiculite and um, you just want to keep them in a cool, dry place. Okay. And how do we keep zinnias from growing crooked? <laughs> how do we keep zinnias from growing crooked? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one on me. I mean, they should grow straight up. Um, I guess uh, when you when you cut them each time uh, on the stem, make sure you uh, cut it down to where uh, maybe you have another leaf um, junction, um, and so it will go straight up from that. I mean, other than that, I I, I don't really know. I would think if they're getting crooked, then it could be that maybe they're not in a full sun exposure site. So maybe they're maybe a little oh, later or that's weaker. A, that yeah. could be part of the question here. Um, yeah, that that could be. Yep, yeah, that could yeah. be. That, that might be a good candidate for why you want to pinch that. Uh, um, make sure they're in full sun at least six hours. Uh, and it might be a candidate, uh, a reason for you to try to uh, pinch that plant back so you get a denser um, plant. And since they are so shallow rooted, I find that uh, a number of my shallow rooted things in the garden, uh, my trusty garden dog will sometimes knock them over in her pursuit of critters and things like that. So things can get knocked over somewhat easily, uh, especially the shallow rooted stuff like zinnias maybe. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, uh, zinnias, uh, some of these plants too that uh, you can plant them 30% closer than it says on the seed packet and uh, when you do that of course um, maybe your flower head won't be as big but it will also help support um, the plants. All right well unless anyone else has any other questions um, Linda you did a fabulous job with your presentation and fielding all the questions. Um, so thank you all. Don't forget uh, Master Gardener plant sale uh, again tomorrow from nine to noon at the Senior Center in Canton. Um, 
And uh, thanks for joining us. We'll get this recording up um, early next week, and we hope to see you next month. So thank you all.